Hello, and welcome to Abby Lee Wellness, a place for sensitive souls to feel grounded and at ease as you learn everyday tools and insights to live your life most inspired. Hello, and welcome to today's very special and important podcast episode about the sudden passing of my life partner, the love of my life, Philip Risch. And with me is Monica Purdy, whose brother Mike is known as a legend in Denali National Park, Alaska, where he passed away. And I re-listened to this podcast episode several times, which has been an unexpected beneficial part of my healing journey to hear myself tell the story. And I also wondered, what will people get out of this episode? So a few months ago, Phil and I connected with a Native American woman who's a part of the Salish tribe. And the Salish tribe is one of many tribes native to these lands for thousands of years to what is now called Montana. And Phil bought an original painting done by this woman, which he gifted to me. And the painting is here on the wall in my kitchen. And it's of a Native American woman on a horse. And she has a stoic look on her face. And she's wearing her buckskin dress. And her hair is in braids. And this woman in this painting, she's called the storyteller. And the artist who painted this, she told us that when the snow is on the ground, or what we call winter, this is called storytelling season. So this is the time where we gather as community and tell our stories. So as the days are getting darker and colder and the snow is in the mountains, I bring to you this very unique podcast episode that tells the stories of not only how these two inspiring men died, but also how they lived, because Mike and Phil were both pretty freaking epic. And what you'll get out of these stories is hearing the human experience with life lessons being weaved among the words. And my intention with this episode is to be as real and raw and vulnerable as possible as I'm in the absolute thick of this thing called grief. Phil passed away only two and a half months ago. And for those who asked how they can support me at this time, you can stop right now and hit the five star rating to help the podcast continue to grow. And you can refer your loved ones to work with me one-on-one as a life coach, as I love working with people as they pursue their most inspired lives through the beauty and the challenges of this human experience. And when you stay until the end, the last 10 minutes is the most vulnerable I can possibly be. I decided to add a totally spontaneous and unedited song that I sang that I never planned on sharing with anyone. It's just a completely imperfect raw clip from my voice memos in my phone of me sitting here alone on my living room floor just in the thick of it and picked up my ukulele and decided to channel the sound of my grief into song coming directly from my heart and this melody and some sacred Hawaiian words just came up in this moment. So grab a warm beverage as we use our listening skills and our presence for each other in this thing we call life that we are all in together right now. Monica, can you share first how you and I know each other and then just kind of how we met and all that and where you were at in your life at that time and then to go into if you have any intentions for this space today, too. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Um, So we met on the big island of Hawaii back in July of 2017. We were both guides at Pacific Quest Wilderness Therapy. I'm trying to think of, like, I just remember just instantly wanting to be friends with you. I forget. I think we met at the training, but I was like, oh my gosh, she's so cool. Um, and then I we just went on little island adventures on our off time. And then 
our shifts got split up so we didn't see each other much so i'm super grateful that years later we reconnected my intention for this podcast is just to create a safe space for grief it's so necessary and important to feel everything especially with the times that we're living in and if we don't have safe spaces to express then it's like where does it go thank you i definitely agree with you this is my first time really experiencing what this big word called grief really is. This is I've never gone through such a big loss before, so I appreciate you saying that. And before we really get into things and before we begin, I'd really like to set the tone and set the space that we are all in together, me, Monica, and all the people that are listening who are here who I believe many of you have very big hearts because you're here either to support me and Phil's family. You're here for Monica, Monica's family and loved ones who have been touched by Mike and his story. Whether you know us or not, maybe you've just heard the story and it's something that has really awakened something within you or made you feel connected or just curious, the natural human curiosity of what happened. So thank you for being open and willing to be here. And I'd like to take a moment for all of us to pause. If you're driving a vehicle, definitely keep your eyes open. Just really focus on the road and what's in front of you and maybe feel the seat beneath you and relax the shoulders. If you're cooking or kind of moving around or shopping or listening with a friend. Maybe you can take a moment to find some sort of stillness and take a moment to just exhale wherever you are. And together we'll take one big inhale into the body. And let a full exhale all the way out. Let's do that two more times together. As we inhale, breathe in. Let the air fill up our whole bodies. And as we exhale, let it go. One more refreshing inhale. Feel the air go in the nose. And a nice full detoxing, grounding release of an exhale. And as we feel the effects of just taking three breaths together, I'd really like to welcome for those who are listening to be present with their own stories of grief, to welcome in the spirits or the memories of loved ones that we have all lost. It can be your pets and animals. Maybe it can be your grandparents who passed a long time ago or parents, maybe even miscarriages or stillborns, any tragedy of ways that you have lost someone, welcoming the beauty of people who have passed in natural ways all the different ways that we die. So welcoming their energy, welcoming your love for these people who have touched you, whether you were close or had very difficult relationships with this person or this pet or this animal. Let's really bring that to this space today. And again, breathing a nice full inhale into the body and a nice full exhale as we continue to settle in to this sacred space that Monica and I have set up for each other and for those who want to listen. So Monica, if you can begin by telling your story of Mike. Yes, thank you. That was so beautiful. Thank you. So that was interesting. I was thinking 
the other day. Um, I don't plan much. I was just like, yeah, I'll tell the story. And then I started to really become more intentional. And I'm like, what am I trying to get across? And I've never, I just noticed with my brother's story, like it's so inspiring and there's so many pieces, but I always just like, I just jump right to the death part. Like he was in Alaska and this happened and no, like nobody knows the backstory. There's nothing to work with like in my head I'm just like I I know everything so I decided I want to tell his life story and life and death they're all one and the same they're both equally as important so we're gonna start off and yeah life is just one big story anyways so um, we grew up on a five acre property in the country in Lansing Michigan My parents are still living at my childhood home, but just to paint a picture, like we had a big barn. Um, We grew up with tree houses and zip lines in the backyard. We were running around with wooden guns and chickens and turkeys roamed the yard, um, playing football and pine cone wars where you literally just chuck pine cones at each other in the yard. We played stealth at night and just like, roaming around the dark with flashlights. And I always, I find myself in my adulthood just really thanking my parents for that. And this will, it just makes more sense with Mike's story too. They always nurtured our wild side and our spirit. And so we, Mike and I, and my two other older brothers, so I have three brothers total, we would just spend hours outside at a time with an unlimited amount of time for our imaginations, um, playing G.I. Joes and Barbies and riding dirt bikes and quad runners. We went to Waverly Public Schools, which was extremely diverse. We were the minority, which I thought was awesome. And then we would come back home and we did 4-H fairs in the summer. So 4-H is like in the country and you're making projects and baking and all of that stuff and Mike's specialty was war dioramas so he would spend hours putting together little army men and painting them and just like making huge battle scenes and he would like always get the trophies for it so that was like our our adolescence and then moving on to more of high school um, Mike still has a group of friends from high school that get together from time to time and I just find that really special I'll join in sometimes and hang out with them and they I just felt like I had so many older brothers growing up but yeah in high school we would have like I would have my friends over for haunted hay rides and Mike and his friends would hide in the corn stalks and chase us with chainsaws and it just always comes back it was just like a very wholesome childhood Um, Mike was very looked up to and loved in the community which is why after he passed somebody I forget who came up with the term live like Mike but it was truly his whole life he was just a natural leader but he was so warm and comforting like there was just no judgment he just welcomed everybody in and I just you know I'd watch people just naturally gravitate towards his energy Um, he was funny talented, athletic, handsome. All my friends had crushes on him. He played football, basketball, lacrosse. He was a valid Victorian in high school, so he gave the speech, just got really good grades. And I guess a little bit into our relationship, yeah, we were just always buddies. I loved going to high school with him. I felt so cool. We would drive in his really old pickup truck listening to Bob and Tom which is a radio show in the morning and he had one of these like microphone boxes in his truck that could make animal noises and like he could talk to people outside of his truck and so he would just randomly make like chicken noises or just talk I okay this is coming to mind right now um his last day of senior year I think it was, or senior year for him and his friends, they bought a bunch of ice cream and just drove around the parking lot playing ice cream truck music in his truck and throwing it to people. And I I just naturally always felt cool because of my brother, and maybe it was mutual, but we just had this really 
awesome bond. Except when we were younger, if I ordered chicken tenders at the same restaurant, he'd be pissed um, for a little bit. And we, yeah, just eating cereal at night. If you talk to any of my family members, I don't know why we remember that about him, but he would always just drink out of the milk carton in the fridge without getting a cup, which I do now. I might have gotten that from him. And yeah, there's just, he's just an overall, just really incredible human. And him and I would just speak in different languages. Like we would just walk around the house like, like just, I don't even know. I, it, he's just one of those people that I'm like, oh, you're going to be with me forever. Like you're not, you're not going anywhere. I just looked up to him in so many ways. So that was his high school. Moving on to his college, um, he went to Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. So he was like in the heart of downtown Chicago. I forget what year it was or semester, but he took off a little bit of time because he started to feel overwhelmed and depressed. Um, that's where he kind of discovered his love for music. I actually have his loop machine right in front of me. He would make beats and he started singing. He actually has two sound clouds still. So he just like left all these beautiful things behind. But I think I'm pretty sure he got into music when he was feeling low and down and it kind of maybe helped his spirit lift up. He was in a fraternity for a while, which I think is hilarious. And he got a puppy who he snuck into the frat house. He was also a pedicab driver for a bit in Chicago. So that's where you have the bike and pull the people around in your little cab. And he would do that on busy weekend nights in Chicago Cub games. And he, I remember he loved that. I'm pretty sure he built his own trailer for it. I know that the city life definitely was hard on him just because of how we grew up. And I guess growing up too, we would always just pile in the station wagon and go to Tennessee or Kentucky or South Dakota and tent camp. We had wild adventurous spirits. So I think the city life weighed on him a bit. But he graduated, and then his girlfriend at the time, they took off on a van tour out west, and they traveled around to different national parks. And so I actually texted her this morning to get the details. I was like, okay, when did all of this happen? We still keep in touch, which is awesome. So he was looking into going into massage school, and she was going to go into chiropractic school. So before that all happened, he went to Alaska in 2015 to be a tour guide for quad runners and um, ATV, an ATV tour guide. There it is. So he did that seasonally in, I want to say it was like April to September in Alaska. And he absolutely fell in love. He loved how wild Alaska was. I mean, again, everybody thought he was the coolest because he was. And, but he just wanted to be somewhere where he could be free. And then after that, him and his girlfriend at the time, they moved to Portland, Oregon. So this was in October of or around October of 2015. And so she went into chiropractic school. He was getting ready to go into massage school. I know that a little depression hit. It was like when he was like in the city and back and needing to like get a job, he would just feel kind of low. Um, we all still think this is hilarious, but he was a car salesman for like a month or two <laughs> in Portland. It's just funny. <laughs> like, but it's also in, it's also really awesome because he was just he would just never give up like he was just like okay what's next like on to the next thing on to the next and I think then sometime around winter he decided he was going to go back to Alaska and just make it like a seasonal thing and that this time he drove from Canada to Alaska but before that I do want to add in so I so this is 2016 now and this was the last time that I saw him. My boyfriend and I at the time, we went to go visit him and his girlfriend in Portland. And we took a coastal trip and it was absolutely incredible. He was kind of our tour guide. And so this was in March of 2016. And he 
yeah, he just took us up and down the coast. We got stoned and ate vo- voodoo donuts. That's like my last thing that I did with him. But I find it really fascinating. I remember going, he dropped us off at the airport in Portland. And I remember looking, he was walking away and I looked back and I had this thought that I was never going to see him again. Wow. It was just this quick thought that's like, you're not going to see your brother again. And I felt, I was like, what the fuck? Like I felt kind of crazy. I've just never had gotten that thought. And I just, I just remember staring out of the plane window, looking at Mount Hood and just kind of feeling a little weird, but also like there's no evidence to back up that that will be the last time. But it was just my gut was just like, that's the last time. And it was. So in April of 2016, he went back out to Alaska and this time he was going to be a zip line tour guide. And um, again, he just went out. He was just he just something about Alaska. I call it his playground. It really is and was probably still is. And he just he also took amazing photography. There's just so much to this to his life and just very talented in so many ways and incredible but he was taking photography I'm pretty sure he had a 1998 Land Rover it was red it was freaking awesome so he drove that thing to Alaska so this was the same time the same week that I was graduating from college I went to Northern Michigan University in the UP in Dayup. So it's my last week. I'm about to graduate, and Mike was in Alaska. He had just summited a mountain that nobody had ever summited before, and he unofficially, I'm putting up air quotes because he's like, everything remains wild and unnamed and untamed, but he officially named it Purdy Peak, and it was quite the trek, and he took a GoPro video, and I remember he sent me a selfie at the top, and it was just awesome. It was obviously just a very big accomplishment for him. It was pretty gnarly. He like probably didn't have all the right gear, but he just he just did it, and he he knew what he was doing. So yeah, I got that selfie, and I was just like, oh, that's awesome. And this was probably so April twenty fourth. Um, I just had a question to ask him. So he had sent me the selfie. I responded to it. And so I sent him another text. And for those of you who have iPhones, if you get a text, it's blue. Or iMessage, it's blue. If you're out of service, it turns green. Or if your phone's off. And I sent him a message, and it turned green. And I'm like, well, he's in Alaska. It's probably just out of service, which he was quite frequently. For some reason, though, that... Oh, this is, no, I'm, I was a little bit off on the timeline. This is April 26th. And for some reason, I sent that text. And that night, I remember waking up in a dead sleep. And I got this very vivid image of him dead, like laying on rocks, dead. And I felt obviously crazy. I was like, what the heck is that all about? Again, no evidence, nothing. It had like a text message just didn't send. So I was just feeling kind of weird. And two days went by and I didn't hear anything from him. And so that's when I decided to reach out to his girlfriend. And we were kind of the only ones who maybe knew that something was up. I mean, again, he's in Alaska, so it's very common to just not have service. But we were just kind of texting back and forth and she hadn't heard from him either. And think my stomach was kind of starting to drop then it just felt like okay what's going on and my graduation day came up and all of my family it's like a seven hour drive from Lansing to Marquette so they drove up to my graduation and I just remember it was such a bizarre feeling I remember feeling like I was there but I wasn't like I was I was with people I was in crowded spaces and I just couldn't focus like something was just so off and I didn't say anything to anybody because honestly I just didn't know what to say I didn't know what to do with that information I didn't want to start anything maybe I was trying to control the situation too at the same time like I wanted to have like my full graduation experience so I'm not sure 
exactly what it was. So this is May 1st, and again, we haven't heard anything. And after my graduation, we went back to the hotel that my family was staying at, and I just go, I have something that I need to say. And I just remember breaking down, and they all, um, well, we talk about it now, they they all just kind of had a feeling that it was about Mike and that he was missing. So at this point, it's like, I think he's missing. And yeah, that's when they sent out the search and rescue teams in Denali. So my dad, I forget that it's so blurry. I'm just like, I tell this story so many times and it's so interesting to just tell it each time. It's so, it's the same, but it's different. So I'm trying to kind of tap in and to what it actually felt like to be in that moment. It's just so dysregulating and I felt like I was just floating in and out of my life experience, but my dad or mom, I can't remember the details, but somebody called the search and rescue. And Denali is 6 million acres. I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on it, but I think somebody said it's like the size of Connecticut alone. Like it's a huge. It's massive. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Huge fucking place. So like the fact that it's just never, you never want to hear somebody missing, but like somebody missing in Alaska, you're just like, shit. So I think all of us were just not feeling hopeful, to be honest. Like, it's just, it was not a fun feeling. Just, I felt like we were kind of in this waiting space. And the first evidence that we got, we were all still together up north. And somebody said, one of the search and rescue people said that they found his car in Savage River Loop parking lot. And so if you've ever been to Denali National Park, Abby, I know that you guys went there and hiked yeah. the trail, but um, it's just like a very family-friendly yeah. trail in the park. It's not too far in. And they found his Land Rover and they found that his windows had been cracked open. And somebody mentioned like, we don't think that's the greatest sign it doesn't look like he meant to have his windows open like he was just kind of going for the day and it was clear that like his car had been there for a few days and so it was just like it was so much suspense and like but you can't really we didn't know like it wasn't official yet so it was just this very strange and bizarre waiting space so the next the next day my I have I had a lot of um, friends and support up north and we just decided I was getting ready to move out anyways from graduation um, everybody decided to drive back down and I was still up north but I had so much support so we're like if anything happens I'll obviously just drive down and I just remember I was supposed to be moving out of my little place that I was renting and I just couldn't leave bed and I was just kind of staring at my phone and just laying there and not feeling much of anything and my boyfriend at the time he's like I'm gonna go get us food I'll be right back and so I was alone in the house and that's when I got the call from my mom and it was like I had never heard her voice like that so that alone just gave it away but she was just like who are you with and I just remember getting up and pacing and just being like no 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 um like ah, yeah how do you even how do you even deal or just fathom something in the moment that is just so intense then I just started to call all of my friends and um one of my best friends Joel I mean he's just like one of those people who will always be there and I just he was the first one to show up. He just came right away. And I just remember I had friends like, I just remember being just like surrounded by so much love and they were just like holding me and it was completely silent and I just couldn't stop crying. And, oh, we went to Lake Superior that night and the Northern lights came out and it was just so beautiful and so tragic at the same time. And I wrote this down for notes for this podcast, actually. And it's just like, it's such a mix of just like gratitude and grief. Like, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that I even had that experience with my brother in this lifetime. And at the same time, I'm just like, where the fuck are you? It's like both at once. I'm just like 
feeling all of that. And I would say, so that was May 1st. We found out, I, I want to say th like three days later, 14 of us got on a plane. And I want to give a shout out, like community is everything. It is fucking everything. We, I remember coming home and there were just like people they were just, I just remember Jimmy John sandwiches and just like people sitting in our living room and just holding us. And it was so beautiful. And I feel like I haven't honestly gone back to that feeling in a while, but like I was just, and not just me, you know, our whole family were just completely depleted and at a loss. And then we just have these incredible people just like holding us up and feeding us and just yeah just taking care of us and it's just beyond words and so somebody I forget who made it happen but they got us plane tickets and we brought all of my my nieces and nephews which honestly was so incredible to have little kids at a time of just deep sorrow they just like really helped ground us and just like keep us in the moment we yeah we got on a plane and we flew there and I remember when we first flew there my mom mentioned that Mike's body was like at, at the same airport at the Fairbanks airport at the same time that we were and the funeral home was right across the of the hotel from us but I guess I want to back it up a little bit because we were super super fortunate to even be able to see him so I guess I want to back it up and just tell the story of how he passed because it's just so it's so sad and it's so inspiring and incredible at the same time so he was hiking Savage River Loop Trail but he went off of the trail so it's like a it's pretty rocky terrain it's not the greatest for the footing and Again, I can tell this story, and it's probably not exactly what happened, but this is just what we gathered from all of the evidence. So basically what we were told is that, and from his video footage and GoPro footage, he was walking on the ridge, so maybe like 70 feet above the trail. I'm maybe projecting or making this up, but it literally looked like he was having the best day. He was singing, Carry On My Wayward Son, There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Like he was literally GoProing a video and singing that. And then he was like, bow, 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 and just, yeah, taking pictures of doll sheep. Just have, yeah, I'm just going to say it, having the best day. Like I would, I would love to join that day. And so, yeah, he took GoPros and pictures and then he turned his GoPro off and the search and rescue guy who found him, he was in his 40s. He had dogs with him. They had been told that there were wolverines in the area, bear, uh, just like there were like, you know, animals, wild animals, obviously, and nothing touched Mike's body. Nothing touched him at all. And he, his body had been laying there for almost, I want to say six what, like five or six days? Which is absolutely crazy because I lived in Yellowstone right. National Park and I would see animals are there within minutes. Like if you're hiking alone, you're told if there's a, a dead body, you know, an animal, like you need to get out of the area because bears are going to start coming in and the mountain lions. And so hearing that is unfathomable. I mean, that's pretty, pretty crazy. Right. I was, yeah. I was just like, you were protected. I truly <laughs> believe that he was protected by the doll sheep and whatever spirits ancestors were around so the guy who found him he literally just guessed he was walking on the trail and in his mind he was thinking what would I have done when I was 24 which was the age that Mike was when he passed he's like what would I have done when I was 24 and he just started walking up this cliff side and he found him I mean it's so tragic and it's so incredible that he was found that again it's six million acres that could have he could have easily not been found so there's all these just a peace of mind factors in this whole story too and yeah so sure enough he they, when he found him 
surrounding him was his camera and GoPro and they checked the footage and they were like, hey, we want to share something with you. We think that he didn't pass away immediately. It might have been a few minutes and they showed us there's a picture. It's actually it's on my Instagram, like way back in the archives. And I I did like a blog after he passed away and I called it the beautiful nightmare. But this picture is it's this beautiful blue sky and there's these twigs and branches coming out and there's blood all over the branches. And so what we believe just based on all the evidence is that he was able to take a few more pictures and he's not in the pictures. I think maybe part of his, like a tiny part of his leg was maybe in it, but it just, it just like, when I saw that, I was just like, you, I just feel like he knew what was going on. Like you, how I have no idea and I can't even begin to imagine what that's like, but it just seemed like he knew that he was going to pass. And so, yeah, there's just all these beautiful little parts to his story. It's not just like he fell and he died. It's like he was taking pictures. He was connecting with the land. He was singing, carry on my wayward son, all these things. And so when we got to Alaska, it was truly a gift to see his body. I remember my parents went into the funeral room first and I heard my mom just crash to the ground. It was heartbreaking to hear them. I mean, that is just not how it's supposed to be. Your parents die first and you die second. Like, it's just, I still can't imagine. I mean, they handled it so beautifully and that's probably a whole nother story. But um, yeah, we sang, uh, my sister-in-law started singing around him. I forgot what it was, but we were singing something and we wrote we wrote notes and kind of tucked them in his hands. He was covered in tattoos and it was just so interesting to see a lifeless body. Like he just lived so much life. He, he was life itself. And then you go and you look at a body and he's clearly not in there and it just kind of sunken in. But I knew I'm just like your, your spirit's got to be somewhere, but you are definitely not in that body anymore and so we saw him and then we spread his ashes it was really interesting I just remember feeling anger during that time because it felt like the media just wanted a story like back at home in Lansing it felt like the newspaper just wanted something and it just felt I felt a little bit bitter towards that at first it was just like holy shit we just lost someone and the media is like Okay, who'd you lose? Can we can we get a little a little life snippet of so a story? Cool. It just like so insensitive, mm-hmm. and also like I get it. Like that's what the that's what the news is. Like it's just they just want to get the next story, and I'm sure they felt something. But it was just it was so interesting to live in that. And so then we went to Savage River. The people at Denali National Park are absolutely incredible. We rented two of these cars and we drove in the park we went to savage river trail we hiked up to where he was we spread his ashes this was the next day so we saw him and then he got cremated we stayed in healy alaska at a bed and breakfast but yeah the park rangers told us we can come back and stay at any time which my friend and i actually did do that in 2018 but just it was like it was the most beautiful, incredible experience. And Abby, I know that you can hundred percent relate to this, but times of grief, like people really, really come together. And it's just a reminder, like people are really good. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on, but people really do come together and just help out. And I just really felt that there and like I said, we we all felt that that was his playground. I mean, if you are going to pass away at that age what a beautiful way to go literally doing what you loved being an inspiring human just never settling he just had this he had like yeah the change the world mentality which I feel now in my life and I feel his spirit with me always I'm always inviting him into my day I feel him the most in the car and I have conversations and I just feel really connected and I wish it wasn't a tragedy I that 
did that and at the same time I couldn't imagine looking back it's like I couldn't imagine it happening and I couldn't imagine it not happening and just yeah again a lot of gratitude for the events and just how how he went it was yeah, it's so much more than what happened it's just like all the the details in his whole life and I'm sure there's so much more to share but I want to end this is coming to mind it's coming in hot right now but my cousin a few weeks ago yeah more like a month ago probably she was um, waitressing in Denver Colorado or outside of Denver and she came across this couple and she was just talking and they she, I think she complimented one of their shirts because it said Alaska on it and they got to talking and I forget the details, but basically that couple was either visiting Denali or like from Denali. And my cousin was like, oh, yeah, I think we can stay at the park. We just have to say, you know, that our last name is Purdy. And they paused and they were like, wait, are you related to Mike Purdy? And she's like, that's my cousin. And he literally said that Mike Purdy is a legend. <laughs> and Healy and I was like that is so fucking awesome like oh I was so inspired for multiple reasons just because I'm like it's just cool years later to hear that and out of absolutely nowhere and he he is a legend and I Abby I know I've told you this but someday or maybe even somebody listening to this could help assist out but I just think it would make a really cool documentary to share his story and life and so we got to start somehow and this is a beautiful way to do it as well he after death it was like a i was obviously pretty depressed for a while and then like a switch flipped and i just remember thinking what am i gonna do with my life it's so beautiful and precious and we have no fucking idea when we're going to go we could go at any time why are we living like this and i I thank Mike quite frequently because I feel like I've just I've allowed myself to live in a different way and I've just been way more spiritual connected with spirit and trusting and just have had so many life experiences after that um which again is probably another episode maybe we'll do but death is so horrible and so tragic and then so beautiful and inspiring at the same time and just I'm learning that for life is just holding space for both the dark and the light at the same time it's not one or the other and that's what I feel for grief it's not it's not a, a process that you go through it's not a step-by-step -step program you have to just allow yourself to feel the absolute depths of grief and if you don't I do believe that it affects you mentally physically and but it's hard to go there but it's so necessary and at the same time when all that grief and horrible feelings are happening there's always beauty and there's always light and it's both and so yeah I guess I want to end my portion by just saying or just emphasizing how important it is to hold space for both the dark and the light. It's not one or the other, especially in the times that we're living in collectively right now. There's a lot of grief, and I just really think grief is, I don't even want to say easier, but when it's shared, yeah, like community, getting together, share your stories, reach out, you're not alone, and we only, and there's a lot of inspiring, incredible people that passed so I just encourage people to share their stories in safe spaces. And I think that's how we'll heal. Mm, thank you. Yes. I first, uh, you touched on so much of the human experience. And I first just want to say I just love you so much. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> thank you. So... <laughs> grateful for you and to know you and to hear your story and I even learned more I realized yeah I didn't even I don't even know if you've told me much about Mike's living story I mean, you know I've, I've got I get 
tidbits and stuff, and I knew he was freaking awesome. And I've been on his Instagram, <laughs> and I, I think he's a really good writer, too. I just fell in love with his spirit and the way he's traveling around. And, yeah, he has a picture on there of him on Purdy Peak that he named unofficially and painting that picture of your guys's living on the five acre farm in Michigan with the barn and running wild and you with a bunch of the boys and just feeling really cool with the guys and driving around <laughs> and being silly and goofy and then to him living the city life and I found it interesting that you mentioned how he kind of went through a depression or a depressive mood and then how music brought him up or lifted him up or he got in tune with music during that time and to then going to Alaska in his old car and traveling up there and yeah really living an inspired life and doing what he wants and I'm just picturing yeah because Phil and I hiked that Sa Savage Trail is that what it's called or Savage Trail Loop Trail yeah, Savage River. Savage Loop, River. I think. It's because, yeah, Denali is freaking huge, and there there really isn't much access where, you know, there's just a few, at least from my experience when Phil and I were there, you know, we had to get into the park by taking this bus, and then we we were there, we went there two days, and then we the next day we drove in and went to that trail because I was like, I really want to honor Mike and Monica and their whole family and to see this trail. And like you said, it's a family-friendly trail. It's one of the co very common, I think, two-mile loop. And it's it was gorgeous. We were there in August. We, went, cause we were there. We were camping around and traveling around Alaska for a few weeks. And at this point, I think it was August. It was a little rainy. Everything was super green. And we're just walking along the trail. And I remember looking over to my right and wondering if that's where I just picture in my mind looking over to the right and him like, yeah, scrambling up some rocks or I, and I just found it interesting that you, that you said it was a, a rescue person or a search person of the park who kind of channeled the energy of a 24 year old male of what would I do if I were 24 and where would I go? And then for him to find his body. I mean, just when I hear your story, I hear the importance of the connections and, you know, what's out there and so many synchronicities and maybe coincidences, maybe not, you know, just kind of like, wow. I mean, the fact that his body could still be untouched in Alaska, the wildest place and bears roaming around and really big animals and to be able to find his body and then to be able to see his body is I've realized too, I think very important. And and then I hear too with how it can be so you're experiencing the tragedy and the gratitude at the same time. I can relate to that where it's like so painful and the worst thing ever, yet there's beauty too and it it's a crazy polarity that the heart is being tugged at in both directions. Another thing, too, I'm thinking of, I remember you had said that his funeral, if you want to call it, I don't know if you call it a funeral or what you guys called it, celebration of life or ceremony, whatever it was, that it was held in your high school auditorium because there were like oh, 600 yeah, I forgot people. to add that part. Yeah. Yeah, there were 600, like 600 people who came to Waverly High School in the auditorium and one of my other brothers put together, which I think it's like in the Facebook archives, he put together this really awesome video of his trek up Purdy Peak. So we like watched that. We got to speak. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. It was overwhelming, but also beautiful at the same time. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I told, yeah, there's so many right. <laughs> different parts that I forgot. So thank you. And also, um, when you said you looked up to the right, that's, he, that is like correct if you're really? walking in yeah that's you probably felt wow that's a, yeah that's exactly what mm -hmm. i pictured just i won't picture myself on the trail and i just looked up and to the right that's interesting thank you for reflecting and listening and it's a yeah it's a powerful story and then i appreciate too the spirit of whoever came with up with live like mike which to me sounds really like like living your life and doing what you want to do and not settling for the city if you don't like the city and going out and experiencing what you really want and 
having those beautiful connections along the way. And it sounds like you two were so close and had such a good, beautiful bond. And also hearing it too just validates so some of your personality traits too, growing up with a bunch of boys and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. We were like the same. I think, yeah, just, um, oh, yeah, burping and farting and just <laughs> climbing up trees. For some reason, I do, um, this just came up too of something you just said inspired it, but I did a yoga training sh mm, shortly ish after Mike passed away. And I think I've shared this one with you before, but basically, I was in a meditation. And it was like the guided meditation. The instructor was like, you're going to see somebody who has a message for you. And I saw Mike and he just kept telling me in the meditation, like, it's all good. You got this. It's all good. And then the instructor was like, okay, you're leaving the meditation. And I just remember Mike was walking behind me. And then all of a sudden it's like he walked into me and my spirit lifted. And so that's how I feel like I live my life. I feel I'm just very much here for the human spirit. And I feel like my spirit has doubled since he passed. Wow. How, how did it feel? What was the experience like when you got the footage of his last moments being recorded with the blood and the him singing? And I mean, I just I'm really putting myself in his shoes and your shoes and your family's shoes. And I, I just, yeah, what was that like? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm trying to think. Let's see. I'll speak. I guess I'll speak for myself because I think we're, yeah, with my family, it's like we all lost the same person, but at the same time we had wildly different experiences. I think I remember the word curious is coming to mind. I was feeling curious with all of the footage, I also, yeah, I just remember wanting to see, I wanted to see everything and I felt pretty attached to it at the time, which is why yeah, I started like the Etsy shop and like sold his prints and made blogs and I just like really wanted to share that part. I don't remember how it felt in the moment. I'm, I, Maybe you if it comes it out. to me, yeah, yeah, I just like uh, too, too um, much. yeah, I'm trying. Like I, I feel like it's almost at the tip of my tongue. Like I want to, I'm going, I'm going back in time travel. But there's maybe, yeah, it might have been one of those blackout moments where it's just, it was just one thing after the next. So it was just another layer and part of the story. But I do remember feeling curious like I wasn't scared of it I wasn't like oh my god I thought it was I thought I and then months years later I'm like oh that's really cool actually because it feels like you knew and he wrote this song this was four years before he passed called dreamscape on soundcloud if anybody wants to look it up his handle was grizzly greens with like a Z, Grizzly Greens, I think. It's like a... I can link green. it in the show notes. Oh, yes. And then there's Native Philosophy. But Dreamscape, he was basically talking about how he kept felt... He kept feeling like he was going to die. And then he kept getting like pulled back and back into reality. And it was like all these, all these dream-like scenarios. Um, he's like, I'm swimming with the sharks in Hawaii about to get pulled under and then he gets lifted up again and then he's like falling through a void and it's just really interesting and I just think subconsciously we just know when we're gonna yeah. pass I don't, it's just That's so what I'm fascinating hearing from people I I I think so too and it's we it's in there somewhere and we it's just is it fear is it our intuition is that really what it is and because once, yeah, I, I, Phil had a knowing, some kind of knowing too, I think. Yeah, he was definitely, the word that's coming to mind, like otherworldly, he saw something beyond this. Mm. Maybe that's a good segue to go in. Yeah, shall I tell Phil's story? 
No, it, I, yeah. I also want to say too that I cry when you cry, and oh. had I had tears in my eyes as you were starting, and and then especially when you started to cry when you were talking about how people were lifting you up and the Jimmy Johns and like bringing food and and how Denali National Park now lets your whole family stay in the park for free. Like I did not know that. Na- I mean, national parks are my favorite. They're awesome and people who work there are so cool. But I didn't know that they were that cool, that they would be that willing, like a yeah, government baby. run thing. You know, I just <laughs> did not think they would. Like people have hearts. People really have hearts, and I think that's just remarkable that you get to stay there for free, and that you and your friend went there. Let's see how I how I will do with Phil's story. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Okay. When I tell. I have my hand on my heart. Mm. When I tell this story, I just also, I really want it to not have it be about me. I mean, partly about me, but I'm also keeping so many other people in my thoughts, too. Like, if his, if his family is even able to listen to this podcast one day or just anyone that knew him, who knew him longer than I did. And so Phil and I were living together the last six years of his life. And I feel inspired by you telling the story, painting that picture of Mike. And I feel like Mike and Phil were similar in a lot of ways and with how people were inspired by how they lived. And I know at least with Phil, he didn't even know how cool he was. And (laughs) like deep down, I think he did, but he didn't really know how how many people admired him for what he was doing all the time. And yeah, I was so attracted to the fact that he had traveled all over the world and he had lived in Antarctica, worked and lived in Antarctica. I hadn't met anybody else that had done that. And He built sustainable homes and lived in Ecuador and helped this woman set up a whole farm. And he lived and worked and taught in Thailand and spent time in New Zealand and lived in Italy with his Italian family and always living very minimally and helping out wherever he went. Like he he was kind of the work trade kind of travel. He he liked that kind of life where, you know, you stay with a host family and they take care of you and then you just work really hard for them. And that was a big part of who Phil was, is that he really loved working hard, but not too hard where it would take over his life. (laughs) And really, yeah, really had that work-life balance. And he, I feel like, uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't even know, blah, like where, where to begin with stuff. And what's coming to my mind right now is the the trail. One of the greatest achievements I think Phil did that really touches a lot of people that people are just in such awe by was he, because this is, this is what brought him to me. <laughs> So he he was he was living in Hawaii already, big, the Big Island of Hawaii, working for that wilderness therapy program, Pacific Quest, and that was I think 2016, and got super inspired to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, and so he didn't take a single day off for a year, worked a bunch at this crazy therapy program that Monica, you and I worked at too, and saved up all his money and planned everything of how he was going to hike all the way from Mexico to Canada. So to go on foot, it's 2,650 miles. Plus he had to do way more miles because he had to go around fires and this the craziest, one of the craziest snowfalls in the Sierra Nevadas of that year. And so he did even more 
had to do more mileage than the average than what the trail actually is and he had everything down to a T like I, I have his notebooks where you look through them and everything is down to the ounce like 0. 0.001 ounces point this way is point 0.2 ounces like he had everything completely calculated of how much his backpack weighed what he was going to put in the backpack just completely put so so much planning and preparation into this trail and so he had this oh, I don't even it's so it's crazy cuz I'm I'm telling his story through the way he's told it and <laughs> and I'm trying to remember how he was able to tell such a big experience so yeah he hiked through all these crazy conditions and it was one of the greatest accomplishments and feats of his life it was a really really dangerous year on the trail and uh only four percent of people who set out to complete the whole trail actually completed the whole 2650 miles and phil was one of that four percent that year in 2017 and he said he relived all his memories like this crazy meditation where every memory he's ever had came to his mind and he said it was so crazy we had to like yell out loud like stop like it was just too much he had so many thoughts and he was like you know like this battle with his mind and also talks about like the connection and all the people he met on the trail and how inspiring it was and he yeah he hiked through the sierra nevadas it was one of the craziest most dangerous years with record snowfalls and he had the ice pick and was like chipping away at the ice. And his best friend Nate, he uh, he's a Minnesotan like me, and he <laughs> can handle the winter pretty good. And went out to meet Phil on the hardest part of the Pacific Crest Trail. His best buddy came out there, and they were, you know, pitching their tent on ice and like cuddling to stay warm in the night and like some serious shit. And uh, and then Phil. Once they got through that hardest part, Phil then continued on his way on his own through Oregon, through Washington, and then his parents came to meet him when he completed the trail because he had asked them to because that was one of his big things is he was just like, connections are the greatest the greatest thing we have in life. Like you have to, yeah, community and love is what we all need. So he felt so deeply touched to kind of heal some of his wounds with his family and his parents and ask them to be there at the end of the trail. And his mom showed up with a, a plate of, I think, spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> and he just <laughs> ate it like a wild animal after <laughs> hiking. It took him five months. So five months solo on this, just walking from Mexico to Canada. And when he was on that trail, he he said something was calling him back to the island of Hawaii and he kept battling with his mind and he was like no 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 I I I'm done with Hawaii I already you know I worked a year at that therapy program and I'm done with it I left it I don't want to go back and he's like the signs just kept saying you have to go back to Hawaii you have to go back to Hawaii and he said it was so loud that he couldn't ignore it so when he completed the trail he was like you know it didn't make sense but he's like something's telling me I have to go back to Hawaii and so he did and that's where he found me so that's where he feels like we never would have met if he didn't embark on this journey that he had to go through for himself in order to be present in our relationship and he it's crazy how it all happened I had a roommate who was leaving and she's she's like oh yeah I know this guy Phil he just finished the Pacific Crest Trail and he's looking for a place to live since I'm leaving you know Phil could take the spot if you're willing to have a man live in the house and me and my other roommate at the time we were like I don't know if we want to let a man in like in our goddess temple and we're just in <laughs> full we live by the ocean and rent was really cheap and yeah, it was just our sanctuary. And we're like, I don't know if we should let a man in here. And my roommate at the time, she was like, no, yeah, let, no, let's not do it. Let's, I, I don't want a man in here. And, and it's so weird because I, I was on the verge of no, but then I was like, 
I said to my roommate, I was like, you know what? I don't know what it is, but I just have a good feeling about this guy. I just have a good feeling about the situation. And it was so sweet. My other roommate is like highly anxious. And uh, in that moment, she's like, you know what, Abby? I trust your gut. Let's do it. Let's let the guy in here. And he got my number. And it's just so, oh, it's just so funny. He basically asked for the directions to my heart. Like I didn't even know him at the time. I gave him the directions of how to get to our jungle house. And he showed up and moved in. And I was actually dating a different guy at the time. And so I was kind of in, I was just in like, I'm not going to pay attention to this guy. And <laughs> And he thought I was kind of standoffish, which was, yeah, he was definitely picking up on my energy and just respected that. And when I really liked that about him, I was like, wow, he's not creepy and he seems to just be really respectful towards me and my other roommate. He would just fix stuff around the house and he would cook and offer us soup. And I was like, wow, this is the best roommate ever. He was clean and mm -hmm. tidy and didn't drink or anything. And I thought that was really cool because we just had such a peaceful sanctuary where we lived where it was really a healing space and so he just fit right into that and he was just introverted and hung out in his room with the door shut and I just loved that about him I was like this guy's cool he's my perfect roommate <laughs> and then I the guy I was dating at the time we broke up and then Phil says that he got a little excited about it and we started chatting and stuff and I remember one of our first in-depth conversations we had in the kitchen there and of the jungle house, and he got me to cry. And when someone gets me to cry, it really means a lot to me because I feel like there's something that just happens when people give you their presence, and I can just feel it, like there's some sort of orb circles over those two people or three people that are just fully in it with you and it's for me I feel it in my heart and in my chest I feel this like high vibration of togetherness and connectedness and so it's if they say one thing or if, I don't know it just makes me cry I it's, yeah I could I have safety in the vulnerability and it just comes out and that touches my heart because I could tell the same story same vulnerable story to someone else and the tears are not there it's just kind of like meh and you know it could just depend on the situation the time it depends on so many things but these moments of when I am really in it with someone and those tears fall like you have my heart and so that happened with Phil and and it was so crazy because I had literally just wrote down a list of five huge goals I wanted to do in the next five years and I was going to, like when I set my mind to something I just do it nothing stops me and uh, this was right before COVID so I had wrote I want to live and work in Antarctica I want to hike the Pacific Crest Trail and I even wrote because I originally thought I would do it solo but I was like all right humble yourself Abby I you probably need a companion of some sort. And I even wrote, like, ideally a man who's probably really good at, you know, setting stuff up and fixing things, and uh, that would just be a good balance for me. So, And then I had wrote to run the world's hardest marathon on the Great Wall of China. My dad planted that seed in my head because we both are – he ran a lot of marathons, and I trained for marathons too. And then it was, oh, to travel around South America – and then the fifth was to become a life coach, to start my own business as a life coach. And I meet Phil, and I had, writ I had written this list, and I was telling my other roommate some of them, and she was like, I think Phil has done almost all of those, Abby. And I was like, what? <laughs> that is so random. Are you serious? She's like, yeah, I know he definitely lived in Antarctica. And I was like, that's crazy. I don't meet many people, if ever, who even care to go there or want to go there. And then to actually go there and then to learn that he lived there. And then I found out that he had started his own life coaching business, that he was super into nutrition and holistic health. 
And then I learned that he had spent time in Ecuador setting up this uh, sustainable farm called Eagle Condor Farms. And then I found out he was this really incredible personal trainer. He worked at an elite gym in Denver for many years, worked with athletes and a lot of different types of people. And so I was like, oh, he could help me accomplish the running on the Great Wall of China goal <laughs> by with his personal <laughs> personal training stuff. And so it was just it was just really weird. Oh, oh, and I and then I had written too that I need to date a guy at least fifteen years older than me. That was like my my biggest thing <laughs> that I had written down from my last relationship because my the last guy I dated I feel like I can't I actually can't remember right now. I feel like he was the exact same age maybe or maybe a year older or a year younger. I can't remember right now. But I remember I had talked to my dad and he had said the same thing. He's like, "Yep, you got to do you just." You got to do 15 years old, minimum, minimum. And I was like, okay. And then I find out Phil is 14 years older than me. And so it was just super weird. It was these very odd coincidences. And then I had him take a personality test because I was I was looking at uh, – I had always wanted to date a guy – I don't know if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality test. I used to be obsessed with it. I used to teach workshops on it and stuff and um, do groups. And, yeah, I was really into it. And I try I try to not categorize people into these boxes too much. But it's, it's pretty cool. And so I always thought that I – the letters uh, – there's a four-letter acronym, INFJ. It's the rarest type, which is what I am now. At the time, I wasn't that. But – I was like, oh, my perfect match would be an INFJ man. I'd always been looking for an INFJ man. And then so I just – well, I was starting to get interested in Phil, and so I just casually had him take this Myers-Briggs personality test, and then – and he didn't know anything about it. And I saw him – I was sitting with him on the the Hawaiian word lanai or the, the porch there, and he was on his computer taking the test, and I saw him then looking at the screen. I could tell he had completed it. And I was like, oh, what'd you get? <laughs> and he's like, uh, I-N-F-J. And I was like, no way. And <laughs> My soulmate. Yeah. And uh, Phil helped me realize that I'm a very calculated person. And so I was just like, oh, my God, it's meant to be. And, and then we just, yeah, started connecting and talking about our, all of my favorite books. And because I read so much on philosophy and psychology and I really like philosophical fiction, and Phil had read all the same books, too, all of my top favorite books. I was like, no way, this is crazy, and and yeah, then we just started dating in the beautiful honeymoon of Hawaii, and we were working together at the therapy program, too, which just gets you in it right away. You know, it's an extremely vulnerable environment, that wilderness therapy program where you're working with students who who are suicidal, anxiety, depression, drug addiction, difficult behaviors that they're dysregulated. And so it, when you work with people in that kind of environment, you just get to know each other really well. And we're sharing very vulnerable things. The students are, the guides are. It's a really special environment. And so, yeah, Phil got, we were living together, and then we got thrown into that work environment together, and it blossomed into this incredible relationship and... It's crazy that uh, I shared this a little on social media where we started dating when the world was cracking open beneath our feet. We had gone for a swim. That was kind of one of our first dates to swim in what's called warm ponds, like a naturally heated lava pool a couple of miles from our house. And we were on our way back, and all of a sudden... The ground just starts shaking. I've never experienced that before to have, like, I'm very grounded and very stable. And to, to feel the, the earth, something I rely on so much and I'm so connected to, to all of a sudden have it be wobbling beneath your feet. And everything's rocking and the car is swaying back and forth. And someone drives by and goes, get out of here, run. And we look over to our left and the earth just just splits open and poof, the lava spews up into the air. We're just like, holy shit. And what does Phil do? He's like, let's go towards it. And I'm like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? And so we 
We're just like driving around watching fire shoot out of the ground right in front of us and watching new life be be formed. I realize I've never watched earth being made, you know, like this is the newest earth that we are seeing in this moment. We're seeing that's how it, that's how the land starts. We get the lava spews and then it hardens and there's the earth. (laughs) And and to watch it be made was uh, just incredible. And to, to start the relationship with that as our foundation was pretty special to say the least. And then our next dates being And I was like, oh, let's summit Mauna Kea, which is the highest volcano in the area at 14,000 feet. And so then our next time we hiked and summited this volcano and slept on the mountain. And it was super cold up there, which is crazy to go where we lived at sea level. It's humid and 80. And then up there, we were all bundled in our sleeping bags on the the volcano. And, And then we made the decision in 2020 to move to Missoula, Montana, because Phil felt called to be closer to his family. And he just really, you know, yeah, realized that my parents are getting older and I want to be closer to them. And are we crazy for leaving Hawaii? And I was like, no, I I love the mountains. And I didn't think that people were very nice on the big island, to be honest. So <laughs> especially coming from Minnesota, that's like, that's our greatest value is be nice and being kind to other people and hospitable and friendly and I just didn't feel that with where we lived in Hawaii so I was I was down to go wherever and we lit- were like where should we go and we both love the mountains and we thought about Colorado and maybe Idaho and then I just threw out I was like Missoula I heard I heard Missoula is really cool and Phil's like let's do it and in the middle of COVID we just left everything I'd sold our stuff, our cars, and gave away a lot of free shit. I love giving away shit for free on Facebook Marketplace. It's so easy and freeing. And yeah, just left whatever and flew to the mainland and flew into Minnesota where my family is. And my grandpa gave me an old, I think it was a 1991 Honda Civic. And we drove it all the way out to Montana. Camp. We made it into a month-long trip of camping along the way through North Dakota and all the way through South Dakota and then all the different parts of Montana. And then we finally made it on July 3rd, 2020, into Missoula and uh, moved into this tiny home, this 350-square-foot tiny home. We, we did really well in small spaces together, even and even in COVID. And he worked some odd jobs here in Montana. And in his last several months of his life, he worked at a place called the Ark Montana. I just want to say, too, that his work has been really, really cool to me, too, and very supportive. And it's a facility that works with adults who have intellectual and physical disabilities. And a lot of these clients, these humans that live in these homes, they had been taken out of the institutions, like straight out of those black and white horror freaking movies of hospitals where people are like in their own feces and just treated horribly. And then luckily the country is trying to move away from that model and they're now moving people in these situations into homes like an actual home with bedroom and a bathroom and you feel like you're living in a home and not in a a hospital more treated like a human and so Phil was really finding purpose in that and he was the facilities manager where he'd go around and fix stuff and really 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 loved connecting with the clients he just said they were so sweet and really liked that kind of work and it was the first time in our whole relationship where I had asked him, how's work going? And he's like, really good. Because he had had several different jobs. He was definitely figuring out this phase of his life because he was 45 when he passed. I met him when he was 39. And, you know, just kind of, yeah, figuring out what his 40s were. And all of a sudden, this last job, he's like, I really like it. And, you know, it's going really well. And I get to go into work and 
I have something I need to do and I get to complete the task and help make people feel better. And I find it interesting, Monica, of how you said that people maybe know when they're going to pass. And it's so Phil and I went on this epic trip to Peru and, you know, I went down there for an ayahuasca plant medicine retreat. I went down, down by myself and then and I was totally off the grid in the jungle for two weeks. And then I asked Phil to come meet me down in Peru after I had completed this really intense, heart-opening, beautiful plant medicine ceremony. And he came down there and we met in Cusco at a, a city in Peru that's at, I want to say 12,000, I think it's 12,000 feet. And, you know, we hiked for five days through the Andes, reaching a 15,000 foot pass and then hiked all the way down. We descended for thousands and thousands of feet until Machu Picchu's at about 6,000 feet. And we spent the day in Machu Picchu and we were camping along the way too. And we had hired a guide and they were cooking like incredible meals. And it was just this really, really beautiful journey. And I intentionally did that so that I could help process my plant medicine experience while still hiking through those lands and connecting with the land and reflecting on my retreat and sharing it with Phil. And, and he was just there. Phil always said he was my my Sherpa. If it, people know what a Sherpa is, it's those little guys in the Himalayas that carry all your shit and just <laughs> and just are behind you silently like do 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 or maybe way ahead of you, but they're they're guiding you and they're carrying all your all your stuff <laughs> for you so that you can enjoy the journey. And that's what um, Phil said was his one of his purposes was that he was my my Sherpa. And so, yeah, we had we had guides, too, on this hike to Machu Picchu of we had some guys that were carrying our stuff, too. And but ever since coming back from that big trip, so this was just in May of this year, Phil, he was saying he's feeling an emergence and I just remember sitting in our living room, and I just remember him being on the floor and me on the couch, and his hands were out in front of him. He was, like, holding his hands up in the air. He's like, I feel an emergence. I just feel this emergence coming. And I was so intrigued, especially fresh after my plant medicine journey where I just, uh, which really softens you, and it's just so beneficial for humans uh, working with these plants. And... I was I was like, wow, what what is what does that mean? I was I've never heard you use that word before. Tell me more of what that feels like. And he had such a I'm picturing his hands up in the air because he just couldn't get the words for it. And Phil was really good at expressing his emotions. He was a really emotional, moody guy, and he really went into the depths of stuff and journaled a lot and would really fluidly express his passions and his emotions and experiences. And this was a moment where he just was at a loss for words. He's like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it. There's just this, something big is going to happen. There's something, something big is about to happen. And I was like, wow, what do you, what do you think that is? And he's like, you know, I've, in our relationship, I've been really complacent because I've just been so content with our relationship and you know he's like it's made me kind of lazy and I haven't had other you know really big goals that I've gone after because I just haven't felt like I needed to and because I'm just so happy being together and he was working on being content with just being content just enjoying with what you finally found because he said his whole life he had been searching for for love for like the one because he was yeah, picky about who he wanted to be with, didn't want to settle, and he was a single guy for a long time, long time <laughs> before I met him, and and then he finally found me, and I definitely had to chip away at a, his his armor that he had from his wounds of whatever that happened many many years ago in past relationships that kind of put up his guard a little bit, and and so yeah yeah he had finally found what he had always dreamed of what he had journaled about and because I read went back and read his journals of his single days and just like wanting to find that woman that he really cares about and loves and wants to spend the rest of his life with it was just really his biggest search that he was looking for and so he found said he finally 
found it with me and so then now in these last several years he yeah said he was complacent and so now he's like well now I think after all these years I'm now finally of dating I'm feeling this something there's this energy of something else is coming I don't know something something big is going to happen and I was like wow okay I'm, I'm curious to see what that will be and I wonder if that was his mom was like he had a premonition and I thought it was really sweet his dad googled a few months ago when they were here his parents they his dad looked up the word emergence and it it's latin for like bringing to light or to reveal to be fully seen so yeah he was going through this emergence and then he Fast forward a few months then to September. So he, uh, this is where I'll probably lose it. We'll see how this goes. Um, So it was on September 13th and I was actually reflecting. I remember that morning I posted on Instagram. It It was this beautiful day where... I took a video that I posted. I remember I put the Gregory Allen Isakov song, the stable song, playing in the background, and there was this eagle flying by over the mountains, through the pine trees, and I was just like, wow, a beautiful morning in Montana. And I was at the yoga studio. I work on a 37,000-acre private ranch where I teach yoga and take people on hikes and do breath work and sound bathing and forest bathing and herbal classes and it's incredible and that's the view that I get from the yoga studio and so I was there that day on September 13th and well actually in the morning Phil and I were getting ready together it was Phil's favorite thing when we were both up in the morning getting ready together and I really like to be quiet in the morning and that was always hard for me because he wanted to chat and really connect and my morning routine is very meditative and quiet and I've got my I really like to use that time to just set myself up for my day and wonder what my intentions are and uh I'm like in in my own zone and then Phil's just like just so happy just so happy that I'm even there with him in the morning and (laughs) and so that morning he he was like I I'm just not really feeling well like he had had diarrhea for a few days and which you know it's just diarrhea and people have diarrhea and we thought maybe it was a just a bug or I don't know but he was like I don't know I'm really not feeling well but then we both went off to, he went off to his job and I went, drove to the ranch and I got a phone call that day. I remember I was in the yoga studio and he called me around 3 p.m. and he's like, he was not doing well. He's like, I feel, he's like, I feel this hard lump in my stomach. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? What, tell me more. And where where is it located? And he said, above my navel to the left. And he was like, it's a hard lump protruding out. And I asked, is there any pain? He said, yeah. I was like, on a scale of one to 10, what's the pain? He said, it's a six. It's like a constant, constant pain. And he's like, should I go into the ER? And I was like, what does your intuition tell you? And he didn't answer. And then he he was like, oh, I'm starting to sweat. And oh, God, I feel really nauseous. And I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll call you right back. And then I just never got a call back. And Phil's really bad at his phone, which I loved about him because he didn't even get a smartphone until this last year. And the only reason why he got it was because his job said he had to. And so he didn't even, at the age of 45, he just had like old flip phones. And so I'm used to him, you know, he doesn't always answer his phone or get back to people right away. So I was like, okay. And he, and he was at work too. So I was like, okay, at what point do I start worrying? And because I called him back and he didn't, you know, he didn't answer. And then 
at that point, I was like, I just need to drive home. And the ranch I'm at is in the middle of nowhere, and it's about a 40-minute drive home. And on that drive, it's like this winding road along the river through the mountains, and I don't get – I have T-Mobile, and I, I barely get any service on that drive. So as I'm driving home, I'm wondering, is he calling me? I don't know. I don't know if he's tried calling me back. And I get home, and at this point, it's maybe 4.30 or 5 p.m., so it's been two hours – since he originally called me and I'm just sitting at home and I'm like okay do I yeah I just I just didn't I didn't know if I should be worried still so I'm just sitting there kind of paralyzed and then I start I just start calling his work phone over and over and over and over and over and over again and then finally a woman answers she's like hi is this Abby yeah we have we have Phil here I'm a paramedic he was in an accident, and so Phil had seizure disorder, which, so he, all of a sudden, I want to say age 30, it could have been maybe 28 or 29, he was living in Denver, riding his bike, trying to make it to in a 5 a.m. client. It was the day after his birthday, so he was, he was kind of hungover, and he was, he was kind of, his body was depleted, he was in a rush, he was in like a rushed, like a stressed out state. And all of a sudden, he was in an ambulance. And what happened was they don't know if he had the seizure first or if he fell off his bike and then started having the seizure. But ever since that day, Phil, at the age of 30 or so, which is kind of just this kind of crazy story, he had seizures. And when he first started having them, he had them pretty frequently. And then as he got older, he was having them less and less. And I witnessed him having a few, and it's the worst. It was It's absolutely terrifying seeing that. And he had said, too, he's like, I feel like I've witnessed death many times before because when I have a seizure, I literally just black out and have no idea what's going on. And so, yeah, so the paramedic told me, like, Phil's just had a seizure. We found him. He was driving his work vehicle I think he was, so he was, yeah, he was trying to drive himself into the ER because when he was on the phone, he was asking me, should I go to the ER? And so I'm pretty sure that he was leaving work to drive into the ER. And luckily, he was just on a neighborhood road going 10 miles per hour and had the seizure and hit a fence. And I think it was two people in the neighborhood saw and called 911. They got there within one minute of the call, and then they took him in the ambulance. Then they brought him into the hospital. And at that point, too, I'm like, okay, well, you know, Phil has seizures, and he doesn't need to be brought into the ER. And because when you have a seizure, you have it, and then you recover. And Phil, he had told me that, you know, I don't need to go to the ER when I have a seizure. And I was just wanting to be a good advocate. So I was like, okay, is it necessary that he's at the ER? And paramedic's like, yeah, he's really out of it. And I was like, okay, that's normal after a seizure. He, I mean, it's crazy. After he would have them for like 30 minutes after, he's in this really loopy state where he's like slurring his speech. He would kind of stumble around the house and it would take him a good 30 minutes to recover. One time he didn't even know who I was right after he had a seizure, which was crazy. And I would, I would always think like, oh no, what if he gets stuck like this? And But he would always come back. And so I was just kind of wondering like, you know, at this point I thought, okay, it's a seizure. And, you know, we've, we've gone through this before and they just told me, yeah, we need to bring him in and you can come in to see him at the hospital here. So at this point now, it's maybe even close to six o'clock or something, 5.30. It had been a few hours since that phone call he made to me. And I go into the hospital and I see him laying there and he's just so out of it, so loopy and talking as though he seems like he has brain damage or like he's mentally challenged in some way. And really really out of it and so I asked the doctor I was like is he on something and the doctor was like yeah I gave him one milligram of Ativan and and I was like oh what's that and he goes you don't know what that is I was like no I don't take any drugs at all I don't know what that is and he goes it's a lorazepam and I go what's a lorazepam 
And he just seemed, I just, yeah, I did not like this guy. He seemed impatient and he was young and yeah, just not good vibes right away. But he's like, he just goes, it, it stops the seizures. And I was like, okay. And he's like, you know, it'll, so it'll take him a longer time to recover coming out of a seizure than it normally would. And I was like, okay, so I'm standing next to Phil. He's just like so loopy and his eyes are kind of rolling around. And he then looks at me and he, so he's with his right hand, he touches his left arm and he goes in a really slow slurred speech. He goes, whose hand is this? And that's when I was really alarmed because Phil was left-handed. That was his dominant hand. And he's asking me, he thought that his left arm was somebody else's arm on his body. And I was like, that's your arm, babe. And he goes, just kept saying, whose hand is this? Whose hand is this? And so I look at the doctor and I'm like, he can't feel his arm. And the doctor goes, oh, yes, I me, or the term's like hemi, H-E-M-I, hemi paralysis is normal after a seizure. And I go, Phil's had seizures for over 15 years, and he's never been paralyzed by a seizure. And the doctor's like, yeah, you know, it's normal, and it'll just take longer because that one milligram that he had. And I'm like, okay. And then they decide they're going to do a CT scan. So they do the CT scan, and they say it takes 45 minutes for the results. And then I'm just standing there in the hospital by myself, and... So then 45 minutes go by. So now it's been three and a half hours at least since the incident occurred. And now looking back, it's like once we found out what it was, time is of the essence with this. And they all of a sudden they got the results back. It's like 6 or 6.15, 6.30 at this point. And that's when everything got super real. And all the doctors are coming in there and they're looking at me and they go, Phil has a blood clot in the right part of his brain. It was along the artery. I think it's called like MCA artery or something. And they're like, this is a really, really big deal. We're going to need to perform a procedure. Like, and they just were looking at me like, this is a, this is a really big deal. You need to realize this is a really big deal. And I was like, okay. And I was just still, I don't know, like there's no point in getting crazy or worried on, until you really know. And the doctors are like, wow, you're so calm. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. And, and, and this specialist comes in and he's like, we're going to need to administer a blood clot buster. It's a three-letter acronym. I think it was like TMK or TKM or TKC or something, this blood clot buster medication. And they're all looking at me and they say, we're, we need you to consent to this medication because there's a 5% risk that it will send too much blood to the brain and cause a hemorrhagic stroke. So at this point, Phil had had a, what's called an ischemic stroke. And so he had the stroke and the seizures due to the blood clot or something like that. And so they're like, yeah, we need to administer this medication and you have to approve of it. And I was like, whoa, 5%. I was like, that's a, that's pretty big. That's a, that's like thousands and thousands of people. And that one doctor just looks at me, he goes, you don't get it. There's a blood clot. This is super serious. And, and it's just like, okay, I mean, we were just staying here for three and a half hours and I was trying to tell you that there's something going on, but. Now, all of a sudden, I'm the one that's like, you don't get it. And, and then a, a nurse that I liked, she looked at me and she's like, I 110% would give this to my loved one right now. And I was like, okay. And so I signed the paper and then that pill is what ended up really, yeah, what took his life. And because they, they performed the procedure which they said was successful. So I was in the ICU by myself until like 11 p.m. or something. I was just waiting. They did the procedure. They told me it was successful, but a different doctor that I liked, he was talking with me and he's like, you need to start preparing yourself for the long haul. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, he's like I'm talking like he's going to have to be going through five hours of therapy a day and... Like, he's like, this is just, this is a really, really, really big deal. And, and he's like, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm really feeling for you. I, he's like, I see myself in Phil and he's just a young, healthy guy. And this just happened so suddenly and you, you need to really prepare. You need to start preparing for the long haul here. 
So I was thinking like, okay, so I'm going to need to be his caretaker or, you know, still don't really know what this all means and still hoping for the best. And then I saw him after his procedure, he was totally out of it. And I don't know if it was the anesthesia or what, but he was not, you know, didn't know I was there, but I was there next to him. And then the nurse told me the best thing you can do is just go home and go to sleep. So I went to bed and then... I got a phone call at 4 a.m., which I missed, and wasn't didn't call back until 8 a.m. when I got up, and the voicemail was just a doctor saying, hi, this is Dr. So-and-so, call us back, so I didn't know what was going on, and it took me forever to get through to a doctor, first of all, so I'm just like paralyzed in my living room, sitting there like, what do I do? Do I go in? Do I call? Do I wait for them? They said they would call me back in 15 minutes, and they didn't call back for over an hour and a half. I'm just sitting there and then I get this doctor that was horrible and he he just was talking really slow and he's like, hi, so are you his wife? And so I'm already thinking in my head, like, what the fuck? You know, what, what's, what, what is this? Like, what's going on? And I was like, no, I'm like, we're common law. So we're technically, you know, we've been living together for six years and he's like okay well does he have any kids and my mind's just like come on like what's going on like in my head I'm like tell me tell me tell me tell me tell me like what 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 what, what's happening here and he's like oh well does he have siblings and I'm like oh I'm I'm basically his wife what's going on and he goes yeah well there was a major complication at 4 a.m. The pill that was administered caused too much blood to go to his brain, and he suffered a massive stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, I think there is the word. And I was like, so is he dead? Like, what What are you saying? And he's like, well, you know, I can't tell you what to do, but around 4 a.m. he basically would have been gone if we didn't put him on the life support. So I was like, okay. So I, st- I still didn't really get it. Is he dead or alive? Is there hope? Is there not? And I'm like, so what do I do? What do you say I need to do? And he's like, well, you know, when you get here, I think you'll know what to do, but you bear the burden on if you pull the plug or not. And then that's when I got off the phone and I just like dropped to my knees and just screamed. And I was, like, on the floor. And I pulled out my phone, and I was just, like, I was really, like, looking down. Like, my finger was just, like, viciously tapping at my phone to call his mom. And I call his mom. She doesn't answer. And I'm, like, okay, who do I call next? Who do I call next? I call his sister, Allison. And I, I, that was the first time in my life I've hyperventilated. I've never hyperventilated before. And she answers, and I just... Like, how do you even relay that information? And I'm just like, (gasps) like, just like, and she's on the other end, probably like, what the hell is going on? And I conveyed some kind of message of whatever the doctor just told me. And then Phil's mom calls me back and she was at church, actually. And I, it's interesting that you, your mom said to you, Monica, who are you with right now? Because the first thing I said to his mom when she answered, I go, where are you? Where are you right now? Because I wanted to make sure she was safe if she was going to, like, fall over to tell mm-hmm. Phil's mom. And I was just like, where are you? And she goes, where am I? Where am I? And so it's just like she must have just, like, I don't, dissociated or whatever knew that the worst news was coming to her. And told her and I just heard her screaming and it's just so like she's in Utah and I'm here in Montana and I just can hear that she's over over there and I didn't even like there's nothing I can do and then his parents they flew you know they they rarely fly and they flew from their little mountain town in Utah and got up to Missoula within 12 hours because at that point I went into the hospital now it's September 14th and yeah, people are like oh was it was it sudden how he passed and I was like uh yeah he had a stomach ache on the 13th and then was basically just dead in 12 hours 
so yeah, it was, it was, I went into the hospital and I see him there and, you know, I just, yes, like you said too, or you started calling all your friends. At this point, I still didn't know though, if he, he wasn't like officially, I still don't even like saying the word dead, but it's probably good that I say it, but yeah, I didn't realize that he was, just didn't know if he was dead or not. And so my, yeah, my friends were coming in, people I worked with and it was just so special because I had like massage therapists in there and my good girlfriends, just women with really good, powerful energy. And they were putting their hands on them. You know, like I have someone who's a Reiki master and a massage therapist over here. And they were all these powerful women were putting their hands on him and not giving up. And it's interesting because later, a few weeks ago, his mom, Phil's mom was telling me that when Phil entered this world, Phil's mom was on a retreat on some sort of, she said it was a really strong spiritual retreat with a bunch of women. And it was just really powerful female energy. And, you know, there was this baby, this baby Phil there, and the women were so nurturing towards him. And Phil was, his whole life was surrounded by strong feminine energy. And Phil was had very he had he was very much in his feminine too with how he gardened and maintained the house and was emotional and and so on his way it's just crazy that then on his way out of the world too he was surrounded by such strong women and I had my friend Lily in there she was playing the guitar and singing to him and singing John Denver songs and my landlord mm -hmm. showed up and brought me food and and yeah People didn't want to, people wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be alone in the hospital. And so different people were just coming in. And then my, the place where I teach yoga, they just pulled $100 out of their safe and handed it to a massage therapist that works there. And she drove to my house and I conveniently left the door open during, which I never do, during just the chaos. And so the door was unlocked and they used that $100 and just bought groceries for me and just filled up my fridge. So without me there, later when I came home, my fridge was full of good food. And yeah, people were just really there for me in ways that I feel like I have not supported others in. I mean, just this whole experience, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just hope one day I can give back to people in the way that I've been able to receive in these last two and a half months. And so we're we're all just over Phil and seeing him and he's on life support. And, and then I started calling his family members one by one and to tell them basically to like say goodbye or to, to say whatever they wanted to say to Phil. So I was calling like his cousin and his siblings and one of our friends from Hawaii. And I just held up the phone to Phil's ear and had them say whatever they needed to say. It, it, it was just crazy being that person in that role all of a sudden. Like, I'm the one to facilitate this right now. Like, that's, like, I'm the adult. <laughs> I'm the one that all of a sudden just has to learn how to do this. And luckily I read this book that really impacted my life, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. I read that in 2020, right when COVID hit. And um, when the library just let you keep your books for however long you wanted, it was awesome. They weren't doing any <laughs> uh, fees during, <laughs> at least in Hawaii, during um, COVID. And so I rented out so many books. And this Tibetan book of living and dying really, really changed my perspective on how we treat the dying in the U.S. especially, of just how we leave them to die and we, yeah, they're in the hospital and they're hooked up to all these things and just how it lacks the spiritual and the comfort and the love a lot of the time. And something I had read in that book was just how how sacred it is when someone dies and how when someone dies, you need to put aside all of your bullshit and be 100% present for this person's transition. And so that really stuck with me where I was like, I, and, and I had called you, Monica, before I went into the hospital to see him after getting that call from that doctor. And you had said to me, just be present. And that really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And so I did that, and that really was a miraculous part of 
the transition because I was just there with him like 100% like what would what would a soul need right now in order to fully transition and that's just love and care and to say all the things that I know Phil wanted to hear from me you know just like saying to him like you're such a wonderful human and you've always been enough and you're you've accomplished so much and you're so great and you know you've given me the best love and because I have never had I've never had someone love me as much as Phil has loved me and that includes the love I feel or don't feel from my own parents and Phil has um I mean he was just he, to me he was the epitome of what true love is to fully to fully love someone for who they are and I struggled giving that back like you know I get I would get annoyed with shit that he would do around the house or just you know little traits here and there frustrations and he definitely had those towards me too and we were in a very conscious partnership where we would talk about those things and work on them together to be the best that we wanted to be for ourselves and others because neither of us were willing to settle for a shitty relationship. <laughs> and we'd always said like, oh my gosh, the relationship just gets better and better. And even six years later, feels like, I feel like I'm still learning new things. Like, I feel like it's just beginning. And so, yeah, I just, I hope that the world gets to have someone love them in that way. Because it's definitely the energy that that heals. It's the, even if someone treats you like shit or has treated you like shit in the past, but to just, you know, to of course have your boundaries and self-respect, but to just to keep having that energy of love is, is truly the ultimate, the ultimate way of healing us all. And he really gifted me that. And it was definitely my teacher of, okay, how to, how to fully accept someone for all of their faults. And because, yeah, my, my little quirks and stuff, he just thought they were so funny and cute and <laughs> would make fun of me and really adored my weird little things. And, and I just thought, wow, I, I want to be that for you too. I want to, <laughs> rather than get frustrated, and which is okay, but to be able to laugh about it and to just accept you for truly who you are and to really mm -hmm. fully love you for that because that's the that's what's going to help you continue to blossom into your best self and allow me to be at peace with myself and to feel that loving energy run through me i mean it's it's the best and so yeah i'm having just telling him these things and just being 100% presence there's nothing else in my mind or other things going on and to be a vessel just to really be a vessel for his transition and then the I don't know the proper word I don't know if it's a like a reverend or a priest but the we'll say a priest came in and another woman and they started saying the I think his his mom called the hospital and requested this but they did the oh this is so bad I grew up Catholic and I don't know the what's this what this is called the um like the what is it the seven sacraments or the last sacrament the <laughs> the anointing of the sick and so he performed the anointing of the sick and that was that was so surreal and first of all it I was just so grateful to have the presence of spirituality in a space where it's just so cold and purely science and no yeah, just know of like what's beyond what these numbers are and and to have these humans come in, oh, their energy just felt so good and they were doing the the blessing and saying like may he, you know, transition and I, I was just like what like is this really happening? Like holy shit, they're telling his soul to move on. Except at that point I still thought he is he still alive? I don't know. And then his parents got there at that evening and then we were there in the hospital. We just slept in the hospital that night, and all of a sudden there was a moment where we had this nurse that we really liked, and his name was Alex, and he said, he's like, 
my gut tells me. And the moment I hear like, okay, your gut, yes, like I'm going to believe mm-hmm. whatever your gut feels. And he's like, my gut tells me that he feels declaring right now. He's making his decision. And so Phil's heart rate went way, way, way up. And then his blood pressure went way, way down. And they were saying how the heart just can't sustain with it that high. But then we still didn't really know officially. And we you know, slumped over in those horrible hospital chairs. And then the next day we talked to the doctor that we really didn't like that gave us the gave me the news on the phone. And he was basically saying that Phil was gone and that he's 99.9% sure that there's no brain activity. And his mom's like, well, I need 100%. And the doctor's like, yeah, well, you know, 99.9%. And it's like, yeah, this isn't a statistics logical thing right now. Like, we need it for our emotional well-being for the rest of our lives to know that before making, like, pulling the plug that we know 100% certainty that he has no brain activity. So we had to fight for getting this test and kind of argue with the doctor a little bit because he just didn't want to. And even though a nurse, the nurse that we liked the night before, he was the one that told us about performing this test and that we should do it. And so we finally got the doctor on board to do this. And this was just, oh, man, a yeah, really intense moment where we're in the hospital. There's... I don't know if they were nurses, at least five or six doctors and nurses standing there. I was sitting on the floor in lotus pose, just like my arm, my legs crossed with his mom on one side of me, Phil's dad on the other side of me. I'm just sitting on the cold hospital floor in this like meditative pose and they turn the machine off and you just wait to see if he takes a breath. And... It was at least like 10, I mean, it felt like 10 minutes where I was just, I just, I turned, I closed my eyes and just was, yeah, channeling this pure presence of a vessel 100% for Phil, for his soul to choose or be whatever it needs to be. And I was just giving him that full energy and that full channeled presence for his, this huge part of life this transition this death that's a part of our lives and and yeah we're just sitting there sitting there the doctors are just staring 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 for so long and then they declared yeah he never took his breath so mm-hmm. at twelve thirty on september 15th he was declared deceased and they actually let us be in the icu with his body until Phil's brother and nephew drove all the way up from Colorado and Vegas area to get up to Montana, and they didn't get there until like 12 hours later. So just me, his mom and dad were sitting with Phil's body and just watching it slowly die, which was really special to be there with his body, but also creepy and kind of weird like you know his skin started changing colors and that definitely made me uncomfortable and his body started to stiffen slowly and I just started feeling nervous like oh what are his brother and nephew gonna see like is this gonna just look really bad when they see him and um, that felt stressful and but yeah just to be with Phil's parents with Phil and his body for hours laying there and to be making these decisions together and oh and I had a fight too with the doctor just to not give him morphine. They were just going to automatically administer fill morphine while doing the test. And I was like, is that necessary? And the doctor's like, well, if you want him to be, if that's what you want and to make Phil be in pain. And I'm like, well, clearly he's not in any pain. And you said you were 99.9% sure that he was already dead. So why the fuck would we give him drugs? Like morphine? That's some intense shit. And I was just so proud of myself for channeling what I know, because Phil and I talked about death, and we talked about that openly, and I know some of what his wishes were, because we discussed that stuff, and I, I'm i just like, I know Phil would want to be as conscious as possible for his transition in life, so he's not going to have morphine. And he's like, oh, well, if you really want to do that to him, I'm like, 
like <laughs> the doctor's like, well, I would want to make sure I have uh, as little pain as possible. I was like, okay, well, if he shows any signs of pain, then give it to him. But it's that's just not necessary to automatically give him this really intense drug and to be to just to be that person at my age like that's just something I picture older people to do that's what older people are supposed to say or I I feel like I, that's you know I would be silent and let kind of grandma or grandfather figure be the one to say those things like the elders and but no like that it was me that was this just saying in the moment what I really thought was best and and then to discuss with his parents like next steps and and that's when I had a moment too I I remembered that my dear friend Gabby, when her dad died, she was really upset about there being a Catholic service when her dad really wasn't Catholic. And so although that was so unfortunate for her, and I know she still struggles with that, it was also a blessing for me that she passed on to me by telling me her feelings with that because I remembered her story and I wanted to make sure that Phil was going to get whatever Phil wanted and to be able to tell his parents that you know like I love your guys's faith and I respect both of your faiths my favorite things about you they're both they're incredibly spiritual people and they've given so much to the church they've volunteered in jails and um, they've done marriage counseling through the church and they've just done so much good work and they're so accepting of people's different religions and cultures and to me what a like the definition of what a true Catholic is. And so I said to them, I was like, you know, Phil wasn't Catholic. So I just, can we not bury him in the Catholic way? And they were just so like, they're like, okay, yeah, we'll get him cremated. We'll have a Catholic service just for our own, you know, for what they need. And yeah, it was, we were just really on board with making these huge, crazy decisions. And right after Phil passed, his mom looked at me and she goes, you know what? I don't know if you're going to like this or not, but you will always be my daughter. You will always be a part of our family. You are, you are our daughter, whether you like it or not. And then she goes, even if you start dating someone else, you're still our daughter. And I just couldn't believe the strength of a mother to say that to her son's partner. I just would never expect that. And through all of this, his siblings, too, they're like, yeah, you're our sister. <laughs> and, you know, they're just like this crazy, loud Italian, Croatian family. <laughs> so they're like, I don't know if you like that or not about us, but uh, I don't know if you're going to want this, but you, you're you a part of our family now. And I was like, I love that. And it's, you know, with the loss of Phil, I really have gained his family still. And... I don't know, maybe I'll just kind of end there and see if you have anything to say about anything. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I was just deep in that with you. Um, the thing that keeps coming to mind is that beautiful video that you made of him. And oh, yeah. just, just truly, I mean, I... I didn't know him that well, but just a jack of all trades. I mean, it's just incredible what he has done, what he did in his lifetime. Yeah, for anyone listening, I'll, I'll link the YouTube clip in the notes of the this video that I spent endless hours on. It's a 40-minute video that captures Phil's life, just all this stuff, all this, his travels and all the stuff he built around the house and all the woodworking he did and his gardening skills and it's yeah if Monica when you came here to take care of me if about just over a month ago mm -hmm. uh we watched that together and I remember you saying after how you were just like wow like I feel so inspired to live and he just really lived a wholesome life yeah it was incredible just what he like one clip he's just fixing something and then he's Oh, you like he literally did everything. <laughs> I know. I was like, what does this man not do? Nothing. <laughs> I'm actually I'm looking at his um I have his pamphlet up and it's very close to me and I'm looking at his smile right now. Mm. And uh, yeah, I just I get I think again just passing away um well too early, but also 
at the same time, it's like, look what he's done. And like you said, he f literally found the love of his life and he lived every day just consciously. And I mean, what more, what more can you ask for <laughs> in life? So, but thank you for, yeah, just walking, walking us through and sharing all of that. I feel like we could talk for another like five hours. On I this. know. Yeah. We only have about 15 more minutes left. So I, I really want to still talk about, I don't know, just like the feelings or the challenges or things that have come up in these past couple of months. And one of, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was what has your journey with death taught you about humanity? So like, what has your experience, what you went through with Mike passing, what did that reveal to you about our human experience? Mm. Huh. That's a, man, that's a good question. I feel, I'm just going to see what comes up. It taught me really that you can go after just, you just experiencing tr tragic events and profound death through experience and just observing it showed me that you can really go either way I mean it can just completely completely take you over just the feeling of losing someone and I think it's important to a certain point to let it take you over but then it's like what are you going to do with all of this energy like what are you going to do while you're still here and honestly I think a lot of people have a big fear of death because they're not fully living how they want to be again not everyone but I think collectively yeah it's like why what are we so I don't know like for me too it taught me like what are we so afraid of like things things would happen after Mike passed away and I'm like wait this is this is not that big of a deal like things just don't feel things that would have maybe like stressed me out before or whatever it just doesn't feel like that big of a deal it's like well you didn't die like we're all good we're still here and it also taught me that humanity is so good and when we again I think we both are coming back to this it's just it's tuning into that love it's like there is love and community and support all around us and overall humans are really really good and unfortunately I wish it didn't take death again for people to come together but at the same time it does and when you're in it it's it can just be such a beautiful experience so I guess again it's like the polarities I feel a lot of different ways it's it shows me death shows me all sides of humanity and I feel like I can just appreciate where everyone is at on their journey. And I just feel the need to say this too. I think overall we could all just use more compassion for each other because ultimately, yeah, you could come across someone and you have no idea what they've been through, death or not. And I just think compassion, love, just coming back to that is really what we are here for. We're here to connect and be in that space and grieve and love and feel it all together so I feel you on that and what about you my biggest thing that has been coming to me is how I've noticed some people are totally willing to go there mm -hmm. and then there's lots of people who are not willing to go there I mean my experience what I've noticed is that people are a lot of the I'm just so grateful to the type of people that I choose to be around because everyone's been so remarkable and saying the best things. And it's just been bringing out such wisdom in people where mm -hmm. all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, this topic that I just had not talked about much with people. You know, I knew this one lady had lost her dad, but we hadn't really gone into it. Now, all of a sudden, it's like some of the two just speaking from her heart to me when right after Phil passed, just about grief and all this. And I was like, wow, you know, all of a sudden this blossoming and I'm crying and she's crying and we're in it. Or I got myself to go to my friend's wedding in small town, Wisconsin. And he was so supportive where he's like, you do not have to come. And I was like, I'm going to try. And Phil was going to go there too. 
and but I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can make it I want to be around my people and there was a woman there and we're here with this wedding and you know such a dichotomy I'm in like the depths of losing the greatest human I've ever experienced and been so close to and and then I'm at this wedding where we're celebrating a marriage of the uniting of two people and it was a gay wedding it was actually my first time I realized at a gay wedding and there was this woman there I want to say her name Ariane she we knew each other in college and you know we were at the same parties and stuff and but we didn't really connect a whole ton we have just a little bit and I just couldn't believe the presence she gave me with people are around and they're chatting and she was just we're standing this in the middle of all of this and she's just like I could her energy she just she gave it gave her energy to me and she was willing to go there she was just in it she was like asking me the questions and I was just crying and you know I, I could tell she wasn't uncomfortable with me crying and I I forget like I'm just so deep in this yoga meditation world and the type of people I surround myself with are like energy workers and healers and all of a sudden I I go to small town Wisconsin and then I'm kind of like oh yeah I forget that other people you know that they, they totally don't live that kind of world where they they don't go there mm -hmm. and people get uncomfortable or they don't even ask or which I understand because they because maybe they think that's what I need they think that I probably don't want to talk about it or that I don't want to just cry at this wedding, but I, but I do like, I'm here for it. And the fact that there are people that are willing to go there, that's what I'm like, that's what I'm here for. Yes. You are reminding me of this analogy that a friend told me and just like the easy way for the hard life or the hard way for the easy life. And the, I'm, again, air quotes, the easy way, meaning that we don't, you can go through life and maybe not deal with things head on and you kind of push it aside. And ultimately that makes everything feel harder or you go through the hard stuff, the grief, you, you go there, you go to the depths of yourself. And when you emerge out of that, it feels a little bit easier. You feel ease in life overall because you went there. But yeah, I would say, I would say more than, I would say most people just don't go there with themselves. It's just, there's a lot of fear. And we were just talking about this the other night, maybe shame behind feeling so deeply, but I think it's beautiful. And yeah, when you come around and you open up and you share your story and you meet incredible people like that woman at the wedding and you're able to connect, you just get reminded like, oh yeah, this is what we're here for. This yep. is it. Yeah. Every time I've been pushing, that's been my greatest goal. Right after he passed, I was like, I'm going to try to be as vulnerable as possible and to let the tears fall. And there's definitely times where I have held it back where I'm just like, okay, I don't know if I'm totally ready to freaking flood all over the place, <laughs> but mostly, yeah, that's, that's, i I want to be here for that. And that's when the magic has happened. That's where I'm like, okay, I'm going to, like, even I brought up something to a woman I work with on the ranch. She's a part of the spa with me. She's a massage therapist. And I decided to just bring up some thoughts I had about some legal stuff. Like, I've had to be the one to cancel all these things. And I've, I've had to be the one to, yeah, cancel his credit card and cancel his student loans, which, by the way, your student loans nobody like they just go poof i think phil still had eight thousand left so if you can manage pushing them <laughs> off <laughs> and do it yeah <laughs> um nobody's responsible for that and yeah just other i i was asking her kind of a legal question she's like oh i know these two lawyers two of my friends are the lawyers in town and i'll just text them and ask them and uh she texts them and they responded back this nice detailed thing for free you know just that made me feel better about a few things I had questions about. I'm like, wow, I'm just, because at first, before I said it, I was like, she probably doesn't know, she's younger than me. I'm like, she probably doesn't know shit about legal stuff. And like, who knows these terms? You know, like these, this is all new to me. I didn't know about death certificates and what an estate is and beneficiaries and these terms I just have never had to deal with. And I decided to bring it up to this woman that was asking me and, and she totally knew the answer. And helped me out and reached out to these lawyers for me and then responded back to me that same day of like, hey, this is what they said. And I was just like, wow, like that's just a reminder 
to yeah be vulnerable and to really let people know where you're at and because the world wants to help you especially when Mm -hmm. you're speaking from the heart and you're just being true to who you are and being authentic and you really step into that and let that come out of you the right people will be there for you and I have only experienced truly just giving compassionate loving energy from so many people so we have just another minute or two if there's any last insightful important things you feel like would contribute to humanity or to those listening to this i'm looking up at um, i have all these messages written all around my house that either their quotes or i wrote them so i'm just gonna read a few that i see okay here's a quote If we understood ourselves better, we would damage ourselves less. And then this is one that I wrote, moral of the story, be yourself. And I think what you were just saying to like the vulnerability, just we're here to just be, and I'm telling this to myself, and I know we talk about this a lot because it's really hard to just be in our truth, authentic, real, but that's what we need more than ever right now. It's just for people to just be themselves and you can do all of that and be kind and compassionate and caring and be in your truth all at once. So mic drop after that one. Heck yes. (laughs) That's all I got to say about that. (laughs) And something I had written down to a quote that just came up in my mind earlier today when I was eating my lunch, (laughs) being inspired. (laughs) Yes. And I wrote down, let your fear guide you, but don't let it rule you or paralyze you. And that's so much of what I see with how Mike lived, with how Phil lived, with how I choose to live, with how you live, and really going after what you love and being in tune with what is, you know, what is the difference? Is this fear? Or is it intuition telling me, like, this isn't the right thing? Or is it really really being able to identify between those two things? And, and it's okay to have fear. We need that emotion. And to recognize when, okay, maybe let's quiet that down a little bit. That fear is rooted in something else. It's, you know, I'm not actually in danger. It's just because I'm in fear of being judged or fear of having to change something in order to live the life that I want to live or fear of losing money or fear of losing friends with these big changes that you can make in order to live your most inspired life. Yes. And just letting, uh, just letting the fear move through you and not getting so attached to it. Just like, okay, I feel this move through me. Keep going. Just keep it. Yeah, just let it all flow through. And the more that we're in our truths and the more we share our stories, the fear and the anxieties just naturally dissolve as well. It's true. So that we just have to keep keep on keeping on. I actually have one more quote. This is uh, this is a Mike quote. Use your skills and keep moving. Nice. Use it and keep it moving. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to come to an end here. Monica, is there a place where if people are interested in you and what you've got, can they follow you on social media or where would you want people to find you? Yeah, I only have an Instagram. It's on private because I am a public school teacher and I just I don't want um, any of my students getting all up in there. But uh, you can can you link it in in the. Yeah, I'll put it. Oh, yeah. 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 So you just. Just request or just yeah, send me a message, and I would love. I'm. I just. I just always want to be a safe space for anybody to share anything. So if you have anything to add or to share, I am here for it, and that's the best way to reach me. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening and joining, and I'd love to hear your feedback or experiences on hearing the stories of Mike and Phil that we all can relate with in some way, I'm sure, as I truly believe what I've seen in this experience is that death is something that truly unites us all if we let it. And in this next month, I have 
space for that I'm opening up now after taking some time off for myself to really get myself back into my yoga routine and really being good about my nutrition. And I've been feeling this good energy going in my body despite this horrible tragedy. And so I decided that I will open up space for a few clients in December before I'm off to another plant medicine retreat in Ecuador for all of January. So if you are interested in working one-on-one for coaching, you can head to my website, abbyleewellness.com, or email me, abbyleewellness at gmail.com. So thank you all for being here, and we will see you next time. Yay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for teaching me humility, for teaching me how to hold myself accountable for the way my words and actions affect others, for teaching me how to treat the soil and the land, and for being an example of not letting a medical diagnosis stop you from living the most fulfilled life. The moment you were diagnosed with this supposed disability with seizures, You decided to see the world and make a positive impact, and you freaking did it. And I know regret can be a very normal feeling for people with such a loss, but with you, I've felt no regret so far. We made a list of all these incredible things we wanted to do around the world, and we were actually doing them one by one. And even after six years, every day when one of us came home from work, we'd be so excited to see each other and embrace, and we'd spend the whole evening just present with each other. So may people feel inspired to see that such a love exists at any age, but it starts with the journey of how you take care of yourself and how you work on yourself. And even though this ended suddenly and it hurts so bad, I will never give up on love.